Praise God. Amen. If you can remain, actually, you can go ahead and be seated. to the book of Revelation. I, I see light at the end of the tunnel. We almost, if you can believe it or not, almost finished with the book of Revelation. We've been going at it for a while. And uh, the way I foresee it, not being God, the way I foresee it, um, I will finish up with chapter 19, and my plan and goal is to do chapter 20, 21, and 22, each of them with one lesson, one session. We'll probably cut down the our uh, worship and praise to uh, some and um, kind of transition as we were before to Thursday nights being strictly teaching. We kind of, with the coronavirus and all the things that transpired with that, trying to get reacclimated to having church services and things of that nature. We incorporated praise and worship music uh, on Thursday nights, but I think it had been probably a couple of years where we were just strictly using Thursday nights for equipping, discipleship, teaching. So we're going to be going back to that rather quickly. As a matter of fact, after tonight, I believe we just will have three more chapters and three more sessions. And with those sessions, we're going to probably reduce the uh, entering into his gates. In other words, we're not going to take 30 minutes to enter to his gates. We're going to enter to his gates in <laughs> and one third of the time of that time. Right? Some of you take a little while to get through his gates like you don't want to be in there. <laughs> if you wonder what I'm referring to, I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and courts of praise. <laughs> praise. And so, we're going to get there. Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, we'll spend a little time dancing around the gates but uh, no longer on Thursdays. And as a matter of fact, after we finish Revelation, the book of Revelation, the format will be two sessions, two teaching sessions. Uh, and I am excited about uh, not just the direction, but uh, at least what the Lord has given me uh, for at least the next little while. Anytime the Lord keeps waking me up at four in the morning to talk to me, uh, I'm excited <laughs> uh, about that. And uh, last night was one of those nights, and um, I thought I was just getting up, just to get up and go back to sleep. And I realized real quickly the Lord wanted to talk, and uh, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> Ended around 11, almost actually 12 o'clock, from 4 o'clock to 12, 12, 12 noon. And uh, I am excited about what the Lord has shown me, has shown me a uh, new revelation. It's, it's, it's great when Lord is, the Lord is talking to you and, and parting, and then when you go study, you actually see what he just spoke to you in the book that you had never seen before. And I've read the Bible up and down and back and forth. Uh, God is so awesome. So I, I 
can't wait. But right now, I'm going to continue having fun in the book of Revelation. For some people, the book of Revelation is a horror book. And many are afraid. I've never been afraid of the book of Revelation. Some people are afraid to read it. Afraid of what could happen. Don't want to see it in their lifetime. I'm on the opposite spec uh, spectrum. I want to see it. <laughs> Not necessarily go through some of the things that I don't feel I have to go through, but in my lifetime. So, praise God. Enough of the preliminaries. Uh, we were discussing the revelation within the revelation. In other words, the revelation of Jesus Christ within the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, again, is about the clim climat climatical uh, or the conclusion of this age, the time of the Gentiles. And book of Revelation ends, at least chapter 19, that is, with the transition of dispensations, time periods. And we've been in the dispensation of grace and what marvelous grace we've had and we still have and still experiencing. And, uh, but the dispensation of grace is closing. It's closing fast. The church is time for the church of the living God to understand the time that we're living in. We have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's not just quoting the scripture. From the book of Esther, it's the reality of the day that we live in. It's about preparing ourselves, making sure that we are ready. It's about allowing God to quicken us and bring us to life and breathe the breath of life in us to use us for his purpose in this end time. It's about putting aside our agenda putting aside our ambitions and our goals and our dreams and getting our head up from this earth and looking into the hills, getting our minds, our hearts, and our thoughts on the kingdom of God. And I believe that we are in that day, amen, as we uh, go by day, by day, week by week, month by month. I am, I don't want to say dumbfounded, I want to say amazed at the headlines in the news. I'm amazed at the, the climate change and the natural catastrophes that are transpiring on a daily basis. I am paying attention. My ears are attuned, my, my ears, my eyes, my senses, spiritual senses are awakening and understanding the day that we live in. And we see the pandemic and the mentioning and the fear of other uh, viruses, superbugs that scientists are uh, mentioning. There is talk in the news concerning the system that we call our solar system, how orbital asteroids and other uh, meteors and things of that nature, how they are concerned 
with the flight of uh, objects in our solar system, and they are increasingly being more concerned that something is going to hit the earth. Uh, scientists are trying to catch up with the very fact that God has spoken that in the book of Revelation, how there are mentions of these type of things. And scientists are catching up with the fact that the Bible says in the last days that there will be pandemics, that there will be pestilence. Scientists are catching up with the fact that the weather patterns are changing and the Bible says that the seas and the waves will be roaring. And as we have seen over the last couple of years, the hurricane season, seasons have picked up and they are increasing. And over the last several months, there have been more floods over the last several months than over the last past several years. And fires raging because of the droughts and the weather patterns. And men are going crazy and in total rebellion. There is anarchy and chaos on many fronts. People are rising up on the streets. And you see the hatred confusion. You see men's hearts failing them for fear, as the scripture said, would transpire. And so we see all these things converging all at once. And the church moves on in its snail-paced walk and walking along the course of this world, not really redeeming the time and the season that we're in. And as the year goes on, as a woman who's in travail, who's soon to give birth, her pain increases, the intensity of her pain increases, and the rapidity of the pressure increases. Everything happens faster and faster and, and with more intensity as she's about to give birth. And they call what she first experienced false labor. It's not false labor, it's false delivery. Meaning the baby is not going to come yet, but the labor is real. I don't understand that's a misnomer to call that false labor. You medical people tell, y'all need to tell y'all professors to get that terminology right. It's not false labor. But we live in that day, and I know I'm not in the book of Revelation yet. This is the prelude. We're here, folks. And the question I have is, what are you going to do with it? Because once I stop reading the book of Revelation in the next few weeks, are we going to go, I'm glad pastor is done with that. I'm glad we've moved on. And you need to understand that we are on the threshold of the book of Revelation happening in reality. And it's better for you that I preach about it and teach about it than you to enter into it unawares. So here we are at the end and and the, at the end, and we see the conclusion, so it seems, or as it were, of the trouble that the earth experienced for, in my study, seven years. They had, at the beginning of the opening of the first seal, had experienced, in my understanding, had experienced 
situation after situation as God began to unveil his plan of ending this dispensation. And so Revelation chapter 19 is the conclusion of the uh, calamity that transpired on the earth. So men think. Because now when Jesus Christ actually comes as is recorded in chapter 19, he's coming to make war. And either you're with him or you're against him. And I'm so thankful that I believe that I'm going to be with him when he comes to make war and not against him. I'm on the Lord's side. So if you will, chapter 19, verse number, uh, we're going to kind of pick up some of what was communicated last week. Why don't we go with verse number 11? That seems like a good place to start. And I saw heaven opened. Amen. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Let me tell you something. When you fail, God is still faithful. And he's still true. When you can't get it right, he's still faithful and true. This title, Faithful and True, shows that Jesus is the keeper of all of his promises. His words are yea and amen. And amen is let it be so. There is no failure in God. Amen. There is no lie in God. God cannot lie. So this title represents the fact that he's both truthful, trustworthy, he's also faithful. God is faithful. Well, you may say, well, you know what? I didn't receive this from the Lord, and I did not get that or obtain thus from the Lord. Don't allude to King James with the thus. But the fact is God is faithful. And the Bible goes on and says, And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. In righteousness, he judge. Every time God makes a decision in our life currently, he is right. God is always good. He's always just. And he's always right. His judgment is right. So now Jesus is coming. As a judge, you know, when Jesus came before and even right now, Jesus is not judge and he's not jury. He's actually the comforter. He's the savior. He's the redeemer. He's your friend. Amen. That sticks closer than a brother. Amen. Jesus is everything you could ever need and everything that you could ever want. Some people think that God, you know, they, they, you see it on, only, only God judges me. You see people with that on there. I'll be wanting to just rip that shirt off of them. <laughs> you don't want God to judge you. So he's coming now 
when he comes back in Revelation 19 with me on a white horse riding behind, behind him, I might want to ride shotgun, you see. But he's coming back, amen, the Bible says, on the white horse, and those that follow him, his armies are also on a white horse. And I like the fact that, hey, right there, we're not the bride we're on. We're coming to, we're, we're, we're coming to kick behind Amen. All the anger that you build up and you have right now, you can just save all that and take it out on everything else. Take it out on the devil. Take it out on the Antichrist. Take it out on the world. Now you so you so mad at the world. Now you can come back and do some damage. <laughs> right now you're supposed to forgive. So you don't come back with no, any grudges. But I'm going to come back with him. And he's coming back to war. Amen. God is not your enemy right now. And if you're not with him then, amen, you will, he will be your enemy. You don't want God as your enemy. Amen. Let me tell you right now, your enemy is not God by any stretch of the imagination. Your enemy, he's called the devil. He's called Satan. Amen. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that's trying to keep everything that God has for, for you from you. God has promised eternal life and life more abundantly, but the devil has come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. But when Jesus comes back in Revelation chapter 19, the world that rejected him before, they're going to reject him again. You would think that now he's coming back to war, that they're going to get it right. But they're actually going to turn on him. During the Battle of Armageddon, where they're fighting one another, as the world has always done, they're going to turn on God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone blaming God for all their troubles and turning on God? <laughs> he understood what I, <laughs> he understood how I just threw that up in there. <laughs> Can you imagine someone blaming God? Oh, hallelujah. Y'all not that hot in here. <laughs> but the motives of his warfare, his righteousness, He's just, and he's right. Can I say this? God loves you. God loves you. Look, at, look, just, just, I wish you had a mirror. You can just, just point, put your finger on your chest and say, God loves me. God loves me too much to leave me like I am. <laughs> Uh-huh. So we say, God loves me. Won't we feel like the rest of that? Amen. Thank God he loves me too much to leave me like I am. Amen. Like Paul, I haven't arrived yet. I hadn't attained. Amen. There's things I'm still working on. Amen. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's some things God is still working on. He's not done. God, you're not done with me yet. You see, when he's done, I want him to say, well done. <laughs> Man, I eat my steaks medium well, but I'm, I'm not going to want to be medium well. I want to be well done. When he <laughs> Some of you like your steaks, blood still coming out and gushing out. You want your cow still mooing. No. I want it done. But this world has repeatedly rejected his right to rule with his godly authority. You know, all God want to do is be God. But the world constantly rejects him from what? Ruling. From exercising his God. He didn't God given because he's him. His, his authority. 
He gave his own self to him. It's his. He has the right. And he has created the church to and uh, built the church to exercise that right to rule somewhere. You see, he can't rule in the world. Hopefully he can rule in the church. All he wants to do is rule and reign. And that's why the Bible says, seek the kingdom. What is that? The king's dominion. What is dominion? The, the dominion is the place where the king rules. It's the place where the king reigns. And so when we're supposed to seek his kingdom, we're supposed to be seeking God ruling and reigning. Well, that work begins with us. What's that song y'all sing? The change I want to see, let it begin in me. Amen. Well, the, the, the ruler I want to seek, I want God to rule the earth. Let it begin right here. Let it begin when we wake up instead of going to do our own thing. Oh, hallelujah. That's what he's coming to do. Now, God shows this dramatic display of judgment. But it comes at the end. It's got, when you look at the book of Revelation, you're like, how can a loving God do that? I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've had conversations, most of them been one way, <laughs> with God. Like, how, how can you do that? Send someone to hell. Have someone to spend eternity in torment forever. Why don't you just snuff them out where they just don't exist anymore? I mean, you are a good God. You're great. You okay? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I just, I'm serious. I had this comment. Why? Now, now I, I did get some, some, some answer. Why? I just couldn't. I'm sorry. I'm serious. I, 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 it, it was bothering me for, this is one long ago, just in, 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 in seeing where we are and thinking about eternity and, and seeing mankind, seeing people and thinking, my God, so many people are bound and, and going to hell. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm thinking about hell and no, God, you, you can't send him anyone there. How could you send anyone there? And he reminded me that people are paying for their own ticket. That hell, speaking of eternal fire, the lake of fire, was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not ever, it was not made for not one human being. It wasn't made for humanity. But, hear me now, but because he created us as free will, will creatures, and because he can't, and within his own, he's bound himself to not violate your will. Even though we'll violate his will in a minute. Are you kidding? Mankind will violate God's will night and day. And God says, I'm not like man. I'm going to show you how good I am. I'm going to show you how just I am. I'm going to show you how righteous I am. Why you will violate my will. And despite how much you'll violate my will, I won't violate yours. And that means if you will allow yourself to play God, and to be God and, and to rule your own life and to dictate everything and to have everything on your terms. And I can't touch your will. And you desire by your own free will to go to the place that wasn't prepared for you. Then I have no other choice to be God to let you go. And so I'm not sending you to hell. You're choosing to go 
because I won't violate your will. So it's not God's fault. And so I got an understanding of that now. And I'm like, okay. And I, I, I've gotten peace with that now because I'm telling you what, it bothered me. I'm going to preach a message maybe soon, maybe Sunday, on this subject. Don't go to hell. And, and the hell doesn't want you. It wasn't made for you. Now, have you ever gone somewhere that you wasn't wanted? I can't wait to preach it. I'm going to say that same thing again, so I want the same response. But anyway, don't act like you heard it before. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, moving on along. God is judging. He's ending things. He's things. He's about to uh, judge, and it's 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 something to behold. But when you look at how great this judgment is, you find that it comes at the very end the book of Revelation. And when you see mankind, how they acting up in the book of Revelation, how they are accusing God, how they won't repent, how they are, you know, destroying the earth, killing one another, and, and fighting and turning against God and everything else. And God did not rush, rush to judgment. God doesn't rush to judgment. But he is patient. He is merciful. He's long-suffering. And all this time, God has been gracious. And all this time, even though we don't deserve his mercy and people don't deserve it, God is being merciful. And so when God finally judges, folks, he's going to be in the right place to judge because he's waited for a long time time. He's put it at the very end. He, he, he pushed back everything, his judgment. He, he pushed back sentence and, and, and he pushed it back and pushed it back and pushed it back to the point that he can't push it back any longer. And that's our God. He did not rush to it. So Jesus has amply displayed his his mercy. And now he's coming back as judge. And he's coming, and he's meaning business. And his warfare is simply just to put down rebellion. Amen. So when we understand this warfare, when he judged to make war, it's to put down rebellion. Because mankind has rebelled has rebelled, and they, has re they, they have rebelled until God says, I have to do something. Next verse. Thank you very much for, and his eyes. Y'all okay? Are y'all scared? Scared? This doesn't scare me. Being able to see God face to face, I'm longing for that. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Using simile, it wasn't a flame of fire. It was as it were a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written. I know I communicated this last week that no man knew but he himself. And so his eyes were like a flame of fire. What is that indicating? And he spoke of this in the beginning of the book of Revelation when he communicated to the church. It's God's all-seeing eyes. His eyes are radiant as the fires of the sun, as the rays of the sun. What happens is the sun uh, emanates rays 
that are high energy and radioactive, mind you. And it's where we get the term X-ray. You know what X-ray, that's why you don't want to take X-rays because it's radioactive. You get cancer. All this emanates from the sun. And his eyes are burning as fire as the sun. He X-ray eyes. He's, his eyes are able to penetrate and to pierce through all things. He's able to see all things. That's why the Bible says that we live and move in him and have our being, being and that he sees all things. He knows all things. And his his all-seeing eyes is it, 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 it's uh, in his eyes of of judgment that's coming. He he's able to pierce through and see. A the Bible says to divide in the son of uh, soul, spirit, joint marrow, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Talking about the word of God, which he is. And then he has many crowns. We talked about that because and that's the word diadem. And uh, not Stephanos. And what I mean by that for some of you is in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are two words translated as crowns. One is Stephanos. Stephanos, the Greek word, is the victory crown. It's a crown, it's a wreath that the believers are going to receive. And here is a diadem, it's what a king would wear. And he has many crowns, many diadems. In other words, he is the king of kings. And the Bible says in that day there should be one Lord, and there's going to be one king, and his name is going to be one. And it's not three. It's not two. It's one. And I know his name. But here the Bible says he has a name that it's written that no man knew. Now, some people, you know how it is, they, they are tempted to always try to solve a puzzle and to try to find out what something means and et cetera. Some believe uh, that this, this is, represents, oh, is YHWH, uh, I don't necessarily believe that. I don't know what it is. Um, I can't say I don't care what it is. It's just that he hadn't told us what it is. So why well, guess? And the tetragrammaton uh, is what the YHWH is. That's what that is. The tetragrammaton, or um, which is the expression that the Hebrews used. Uh, to say God because they, they, they weren't allowed to speak of his name. His name was so holy and reverenced that they just put the Y-H-W-H and there were no vowels. And so uh, we added or they added vowels inside to make Yahweh in the Y-H-W-H. And then the translation or transliteration is Jehovah. And so uh, when a certain religious group come around saying they're Jehovah Witnesses, I tell them I am too. I am a Jehovah Witness. And of course, when I talk to them about who Jehovah really is, we have a good time. I love having a good time discussing the Bible. Amen. You don't have to be intimidated with the word at all. So anyway, moving on along. Uh, you can go to the next verse, please. And he was uh, clothed or, uh, with a vesture dipped in blood. And I, while the other, everyone else is coming on the white horse and they have white clothing, he's going to have blood on his. And his name is called the word of God. And so when he comes back, there's going to be no question about who he is. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing how well, hopefully I'll have opportunity to get to it. I should because I want to close this out today. Um, how in the uh, New Testament, 
Gospels, it talks about uh, people uh, making sure that they're not, they're not deceived because of false Christ. And it says to go not out into the desert. And they say, lo, he is here, follow not after them. And, and I personally don't believe it's no way in the world that could be referring to the church because we know that he's not going to be in the desert. We know he's not going to be in the field. Why would, why would he be telling the church that? that? That passage of scripture you'll find is not talking to the church. Because we know we're looking for him where we're supposed to be looking for him at. And we know that he's going to have a vesture dipped in blood. And so I'm telling you what, I'm not looking for, well, you know what, if somebody comes, I don't care how they uh, look, must they look like what uh, Hollywood's rendition of Jesus is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, they have a, and they have some good ones out there. Uh, in our last uh, prophecy conference, we, uh, we showed one. Some of those guys look just like what the Hollywood say Jesus looks like. <laughs> and somebody can look like that, and I don't care if somebody, you know, somebody can actually go and take some, some uh, instruments and, and put punch something in their hand maybe and let it bleed and then let it heal and say, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not following all that. Because if he doesn't, if, if I don't meet him in the air, he's not Jesus. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> Anything, the Bible says I'm going to be caught up. Whether I die before he get here or whether I'm alive when he get here. I personally subscribe to the latter. But when I, I'm going to be caught up, and so I, anything else is not Jesus, period. And Satan is a poor imi Im Im imitation. He can't, he can't possibly be like Jesus, now, no, no matter how hard he tries. And so anyway, moving on along, next verse, please. And the armies which were in heaven... Follow him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen or f and white and clean. We, we discussed this last week, so I don't know if I'm going to really spend a lot of time uh, dealing with that. Uh, let's see. Just let's move on along. Let's go to verse. Yeah, just keep on moving. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Talked about that two-edged sword, which is what, folks? Is that the Logos? The Rhema. Attention. It's not the written word. It's the Rhema, the spoken word. Out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nation. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to take a pause right here. See, the word to some is what smite, and the word to others is what heal and helps and delivers. You're going to have to determine what the word is for you. Because sometimes some people have a hard time. Pastor, you just spanked us. You just told me what you are, what side you're on. You just cut me. No, the word isn't intending to cut. It's only cutting people who are moving. No. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> the word is not intending to cut me. If I pull a sword out on you, oh, you might, you, I don't know, you might pull one of those ninja moves on me. <laughs> that was funny. You know, you got to admit that. Come on, man, give me. <laughs> and I pull that sword out on you, right? What would you do? You don't know? S Sarah, what would you do? Sister Yee, what would you do? You would run, all right? If I pull a gun out on you, what would you do? Surrender, because that's what I was really looking for. <laughs> All right. You would surrender. Do you know when God pulls out a sword on the church, it's just to get us to surrender? Right. And the only time it cuts you when you're moving, all, just fighting and everything else. It's like when you're trying to save somebody that's drowning, the last thing they can do is to do all that fighting back. 
Just keep still. When you're, when you're in surgery, the worst thing you can do is move all, doing jerking. That's why they got to put you to sleep. So you won't be moving around and fighting and resisting. But he's coming with the sword to smite the nations, not the church. And he shall rule them with a rod. Now, now see, there we go. Oh, I love the word of God. It's sweet to some. To others, it's bitter. The book of Revelation is sweet. He said he come to rule what? I didn't hear you. Them with the rod of iron. He's not ruling me with the rod of iron. I'm, rule, I'm actually rule, ruling and reigning with him. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the almighty God. Verse 16, please. I'm going to try to move on along. I'm try to go a little faster. He have on his vesture and on his, high, on his thigh a name written. Now on his thigh we see king of king and lord of lords. There we go. Next verse. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the files, the files, sorry, that fly in the midst of the heaven. And so here you see the heaven is not talking about that heaven. And so a lot of times you have to interpret, make sure, you have to put the Bible in the right context. And so heaven is the sky, it's the, it's the first heaven, second heaven, and third heavens, according to Paul. Um, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. You notice that? Now this supper is not the marriage supper of the Lamb that was mentioned in the verse, I believe it's verse, let me, let me just. Verse number seven. Okay. So in verse number seven, it talks about the marriage, the marriage of the Lamb is, and, and is referring to the marriage supper. Here, this is not referring to the marriage supper that Jesus spoke of in the, in the Gospels. And uh, go back, please. I think it was 17. Now, this great supper is another supper. So in Scripture, uh, the Bible speaks of four suppers in the New Testament, four different types of suppers in the New Testament that God makes available. Now watch this. I, again, there are four suppers that God makes avail will make available to us. The one is alluded to in Jesus' parable that he spoke of in Luke chapter 14, verse 16. You have to fly through these scriptures to help me, please. This is the first one. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. Please, yeah. And sent his servant. Remember that you saw that, that great supper. Right? You saw that? All right. Now. And bade many, um, uh, let's see, and he sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready, keep flying. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have uh, bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. And I, I pray thee, give me excuse, come on, fly with me. And another said, I have uh, bought five uh, yoke of auction and I have to go and prove them. I pray, hey, give me excuse. Another said, I have, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and shoot and showed, I hate saying shoot, his uh, Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto the servant, go out quickly in the streets and the lanes of the city, bring hither the poor, the, the maimed, the halt, the blind, and the servant said, Lord, Lord, it is done as, a, uh, as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go into the 
highways and hedges and compelled them to come in that what? My house. My house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Okay? So that's the first house or the first supper that's mentioned. The second one is mentioned in Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear, now this is now, he's talking to the church. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and shall sup with, and will sup with him and he with me. So right now, Jesus is saying that, hey, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Now, Jesus was bidding people to come to the supper where he was given a parable. And I believe, again, that he was referring to the Jewish nation that he was inviting. And they, would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't participate in what Jesus was doing. Now he's telling the church, hey, I'm standing at your door knocking. I will, sup, I will have supper with you. Right now we can have communion with Jesus. We can sup with him, but we got to open the door. Now, next verse. Or actually, the next, uh, not necessarily the next verse, the next one is found in Revelation 19, verse 9. He said to me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And then lastly, the one that's found in Revelation 19 and 17. Bingo. So, those who typically reject the first supper will reject the second supper as well. And the second supper is allowing the Lord to sup with you in your house. And if you miss that second one, you don't make it to the first two, you're invited to the third supper. The third supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you don't make it to the marriage supper of the Lamb, you will make it to the supper right there. And that, that supper is the fowls of the air feasting on you in the tribulation period. And so I am determined that I'm going to let the Lord sup with me and me with him, and I'm going to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and so uh, I won't have to worry about this particular supper. So it's, a lot of times people think this particular one is the same as the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it is not. So we'll move on. I'm moving quickly through this. And I saw an angel stand. Nope. Thank you. And uh, that is talking about the birds of the air, the fowls, that, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, because he was calling and commanding the fowls of the air to come, or the fowls of heaven, that they would eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of the captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of the horses and of, of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. You can keep going. Now, so that particular uh, supper is something that transpires in the tribulation period. Now, John the Revelator said, I saw the beast. Now, and again, the beast is, as it relates to this, the Antichrist is not the beast system or the beast kingdom. Sometimes the beast represents the man called the Antichrist, and other times it represents his kingdom, and thirdly, and other times it represents him and his kingdom. Here, it's the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. That person that the Bible talks about that will cause many to receive the mark of the beast and to worship him. And uh, 
I personally believe that he is well and alive today. I'm not trying to figure out who he is. I could care less who the Antichrist is. All I care about who Jesus Christ is. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the mark of the beast. I'm looking for the mark of the high calling of God. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Imagine that. I mean, you know what? If, you, if you're a betting man, then you, you could bet on that. I don't know if, if betting's going to be going on at that time, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's a shoe in I mean, it, come on. Fighting against God. That's why I don't understand why people try to fight against God. Why does the church, why do we fight against God? God is God's will. You can't win. I can't win. Next verse. So they're going to fight. I mean, that's, that's smart. And the beast was taken, the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet. That was the second beast that rose up in uh, Revelation chapter 13. So you had two beasts that rose up, one out of the land. The other one out of the sea, I should have said vice versa, the sea first and the one that ran, came out, out of the land is the, the false prophet. Amen. Again, some people, some people believe the false prophet is going to be, a, a Jew, it's going to be Jewish or the Hebrew uh, descent. I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's one way to look at it. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Don't, don't believe something just because somebody performed a miracle. I'm trying to help somebody right now. That, oh, they prophesy and they see miracles and all that. I'm like, that don't mean that you're right with God. The devil can perform miracles. Pharaoh's magicians did the first several miracles that uh, Moses did. Moses cast his stick out. His, uh, Pharaoh's like, ha! We can do that too. Come on, boys, show them. Bang. And, and, and then he, uh, frogs, uh, you know, the water turning into blood. Pharaoh's magicians, oh, blood. They did, they did it too. Same pop. And, and then frogs. They cause frogs to come out. Why would somebody want to cause frogs? I mean, you know, I go around my house and there's frogs going on and all. I'm like, oh, man, I'm in Egypt. <laughs> all over the place. They, they perform the same thing to a certain point. The devil can only go but so far. His power is limited. God is the all-powerful one. God is the only one that can do all things. But, you, you know, it, it's not the miracles that you can do. I don't, I, it's the message that you preach. So what I want to know, you show me miracles, that's fine. They don't make, if people say, do, you know what, you go to a palm reader, you don't think those people have some stuff with them? Some of y'all think they're faking. Now, some of them just trying to make money, but some of them are under the influence of some spirits. Now, I've had some demons talk before, talk to me. I had some demons recognize who I was. Oh, yes. I had some, some, some serious stuff. I was brother, you tell you about the time they went to go cast out demon. That demon told them everything about them, them, about everything about themselves. They're like, there's no way that that person could know. That person didn't even know them. That demon began to spit it out, tell everything about them. But it was able to tell everything about the past, but it couldn't tell them about their future. The devil had to lie about the future. And power doesn't mean anything. The gifts and calling of God without repent, repentance, somebody can. And so I'm trying to tell a person, hey, that, that doesn't impress me. What I, my concern is that this, what, what's being said, doesn't line up with the word. So don't listen to the mess. If you people go out everywhere for these healing uh, crusades, I can go to heaven all broke up physically. I'm not following it. I'm not following that. I'm following the word. See, the miracles supposed to confirm the word. And most
most of the time, if the miracles doesn't follow the word, the word is not following miracles. If it does, that, that word better, the problem is that miracle better line up with the word. And the problem is miracles don't always line up with the word. This guy was preaching something. These guys were preaching something, but they were leading people astray. And so this false prophet and the Antichrist, whom people will be duped by, uh, they, they have power. They're going to have power, and, and people have that now. And that, there are people who, I'm telling you what, I know some people, some mighty men of God that, that have fallen, and God didn't take away their power just like he didn't take the devil's power away. The Bible says, and so here it is. These people have power, says, with, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. He deceived them, caused them to get the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so these are the first people that will be cast in the lake of fire. The eternal, this is the eternal lake of fire. This is not Hades. The Bible says Hades will be cast in the lake of fire also. So anybody that goes to Hades will be cast in the lake of fire. But these people are going to be cast alive in the lake of fire. Now, they're not going to get off easy, meaning then they're going to, their bodies and everything else are going to get consumed. They're going to be cast alive, meaning, oh, hallelujah. You know how it says that we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye? And our bodies are going to be changed? Amen. And we're going to put on immortality. Death, where is thy sting and all that? Great, where is the victory? Well, you know what? The same thing is going to happen to these guys. They're going to be changed instantly. They're not going to see death. They're going to be cast alive. They're not going to have the same bodies. Oh, hallelujah. Now, see, everybody's going to get a changed body. Some a glorified body and some are unglorified body. But it will be... Com composed with material where you can't die, but you can suffer for eternity. And anybody who follows them, and we know who leads those two guys is the devil. Anybody who follow, follows him will be cast also at some point in the lake of fire. That's coming up in the next chapter. And the remnant of people that was fight, that, that fought against uh, the one who rode on the horse, and we know the one who rode on the horse, Jesus. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, which is his word. See, all Jesus had to do was speak the word. You know, when Jesus comes back with an army, you know what? Now, I, I, like I've mentioned before, I've told y'all before, I like, uh, y'all just have to pray for me. I, I like guns. I don't have one, but I like them. I like guns. I just like the, 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 like the craftsmanship and, and all that. I just, I, it's art. I'm, I like art. I just like guns. I like them. I even like swords and knives and all that. I wouldn't mind having a, a nice collection, to be honest. It's a collection. It's not to, you know, go do something. <laughs> but if I need to take care of some business, <laughs> take care of some business. Coming up in here. <laughs> Turn him into a number two real quickly. Full of lead, in case you wonder. But when I come back with him, with him, when I'm with Jesus, I don't need this, I don't need a gun. I need a sword. He has the sword. We're not going to come back with anything. We're just going to come back on our horses. And he's, he's going to do all the talk. We're, he's going to do the talking for us. We're not, we're not even going to have to say a word. We're going to be like we marched around Jericho, don't say a word. And he's going to fight. 
If I hold my peace, then the Lord's going to fight my battles. Amen. He's going to fight the battle, and all, all I'm doing is being with him. Amen. That's it. No weapons. No weapon. <laughs> uh, and so, which proceed of our mouth, and all the fowls, uh, fowls were filled with their flesh, remnant of those that fought against them. Now, this is not everybody on earth, okay? Everybody won't fight against him. There will be some people alive on earth. I can prove it, or, or I can just read scripture to prove it. Okay? So, next verse. And we'll, we'll see that, maybe. I, I didn't get to some of the stuff that I wanted to get to, but it's in the notes. And by the way, uh, I do have a folder with all chapters, uh, with every chapter, all the notes, and I have more notes than I preach about. So if you want access to it, I can give you that. And some of you already, I think I have 40-something people that are on the, the, uh, the, the uh, group that I send this out, which I'm going to send this out tomorrow. But anyway, next verse. That's the last verse. Oh, I see, I just got fed. And out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So anyway, that's good. I, I went through all that. I, I don't think, I, there's, I have plenty of notes. I don't think I'm going to go through anything else uh, that's, that's related to that. Uh, we'll jump into chapter 20 uh, next week. Uh, and that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful chapter. The whole Bible is wonderful, obviously. Uh, I did, I, I know what I wanted to get to. I didn't talk about, again, it's in the notes, uh, about the church, about, let me do this. It's, it's 8.40. I'm, I'll still get you out before 9. They're going to get you. <laughs> you can stand behind me. We'll be, you'll be okay. Yep. He told, he gave the authorization. Matthew. Now, you know what? I'm going to stop. If you, if you care to, if you want the notes, I was going to show you and demonstrate that the church is coming back with him. In the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke, it, it appears that Jesus is talking about the rapture, but he's not. He's talking about the second coming. He's not talking about the rapture. Do you know that Jesus didn't talk about the rapture? Do you know that the rapture was, uh, according to Paul, it was a mystery. Paul, Paul was the one who opened the mystery of the rapture. Jesus didn't come to talk about the rapture. He was trying to talk. He was coming to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And his focus wasn't on the rapture of the church. In Matthew chapter 24, um, I, I'm still going to let you out, like I said. I really am. Don't listen to him. <laughs> oh, somebody boiling right now, boy. <laughs> boiling. Be quiet, man. Let's, for time's, for time's sake, let's drop down to verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Like I said, I'm not worrying about those, those guys, false Christ and all that. Keep going, please. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Next verse. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. What end? What end? Is he talking about the rapture, or is he talking about something else? 
Well, I will say that he's not talking about the rapture. The next verse says, when ye... Now, no, could y'all notice the pronouns? Y'all understand the pronouns, right? Even though King James, for it would be you and uh, he and all that. King James is ye and thee. And so, when ye... Therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Is he talking to the church? He's not talking to the church. The abomination of desolation that was spoken about Daniel was to the children of Israel, and that's all it was to. When, and, and as a matter of fact, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, whosoever readeth let him understand. Then, here we go, let them, them, which be in Judea, flee to the mountains. He's not talking to the church. I don't plan on going to Judea, and I'm not fleeing from the mountains. Next verse. Please. Oh, let him, which is on the housetop, not come down. I know he's definitely not talking to me, because I'm not going to be on no housetop. <laughs> Nobody roof to take anything. Say, ask, you, hey, it's not a rapture. Well, now, if he was great. See, people say, hey, that's the rapture. Don't come down. Take anything out. Hey, yeah, come on. If that's the rapture, you know what? You ain't going to, you know, coming down, take something out like you can take it with you. The church knows it's not taking anything with them. This is not talking about the rapture. These verses have nothing to do with the rapture. Next verse. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child. Definitely not me. And to them that give suck in those days, the mighty who's breastfeeding. But pray that, what? Pray ye. If this is talking to the church, then listen to this. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, nor neither on the Sabbath day. Since when did the church of the living God have to worry about the Sabbath day? Wasn't talking about, when he said ye, he was talking about you, don't pray that ye, it's not on the Sabbath day. He was talking about the Israelites who worship and practice the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation. That's talking about the tribulation period. Not talking to the church. How do I know? Go back to verse number one. Please. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of what? The Jewish temple. Right now, everything is going to be related to the Jewish temple. And whatever else he had to say, watch this. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? What was he looking at? Everything that was involved in the, the temple. See ye not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. If he was talking to the church, that temple is still up right now. And that's what we need to look for. If he was talking about the rapture. And he sat on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us. Now here's the, here are the questions they had. Tell us. When is the rapture going to take place? Isn't that what they said? No. They weren't even talking about the rapture. They weren't even a church yet. Jesus hadn't even built this church yet. Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? What, they, what Jesus has talked about, about the destruction of the temple. When is that going to happen? And what shall be the sign of the rapture? No, of thy coming. The rapture, as I told you before, and Scripture tells you, the rapture and the second coming is not the same thing. They want to, he want, they want to know what shall be the time of thy coming, parousia, the Greek word, and, and of the end of the age, the word, world there is the eon. It's not the world's going to be destroyed, the end of this age or dispensation because they were expecting a new age where Jesus Christ reigns as Messiah at the 
millennial period. The millennial period begins the new age, meaning Jesus coming back the second time, his advent will initiate the end of that age where he ushers in the 1,000-year the period known as the millennial period. That happens at the end of the seven years, not at the beginning. And so everything that the disciples were asking were related to that end time, had nothing to do with the rapture. The rapture was a mystery according to Paul. Paul said, I show you a mystery. Not all will sleep, but all will be changed. Paul was unveiling a mystery that had been hid throughout the ages, the Bible says. Jesus never came to mention anything about the rapture because he didn't talk about the church except for in two places. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he is. And he has built his church, and he's still building his church. And the rapture is something that happens to the church. It doesn't happen to the world. Now, I mean, the props, and that's why people mess up Scripture. Mess it up. Now, he goes on uh, to talk about things that happen at the end. If you go down to verse number 30, so, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's Revelation 19, what we just read in Revelation 19. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and that means that's people with him. Remember, the arm is with him. This is not the rapture right here. In this verse, this verse is this is identical to Revelation chapter 19 when he comes back with his armies. And then shall why? Then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. During a rapture, that, the, the world doesn't see him. No one else sees him at all. But the church. Then when you go to, if you go to the book of Luke, it makes it so much clearer. Y'all have a couple of more minutes? Luke, Luke chapter, Luke 21. I believe it's Luke 21. And let's, let's see. I'm, I just want to teach you a little bit real quick. For some of you, I know this is new. I used to believe stuff just because people said it, and I used to believe it. And like, until I start reading it for myself, like, this stuff doesn't add up. Verse number 20, for time's sake. Here we go. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. You see that? He was referring to Jerusalem. Go back. The desolation was not. That happened in 878 uh, A.D. So, uh, Luke gives us a different insight to let us see that he's not talking about the rapture. And when you shall see the uh, uh, Jerusalem compassed with armies, let, know that the desolation is not. Now, I know it's going to happen again uh, in the tribulation period. Keep going. But the temple wasn't there. They, was, they had asked the question about the temple. That was destroyed. Then let them which are in Judea flee for, to the mountains, and them which are in the midst of, of it depart out, and let them... Uh, that are in the countries enter there in two. And so I believe it was two segments about what was going to happen in 70 AD and also what's going to happen in the tribulation period for the Jews when, 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 when um, the Bible talks about all the nations coming against them in the last days. Next verse. Quickly. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Keep going. But woe unto them that are with child, like Matthew said, and to them that give suck, like Matthew said, in those days. For there shall be great distress, what? In the land, talking about Jerusalem, and, and wrath upon who? Who is that talking about? It's not talking about wrath upon the church. It's talking about his people. It's talking about the Israel, Israelites, who they were talking to, who he was talking to. He was talking to Israelites. He was talking to Jews. He was talking to his disciples who were Jews. Next verse. 
and the other people that were there. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. See, you know what? Read, understanding this stuff is really not hard. First thing you got to do is dismiss some of the stuff that you hear out there that, that, that changes what the Word of God has to say, uh, and then, then, then it makes sense. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 1. I'm closing with this. No, Revelation chapter 1. I think it's verse, let me see. I'm closing with this. And you don't even have to play any music. I appreciate it, though. You want, you want to play, you can play, it's fine. Um, let me see. Here we go. I'm still getting you out on time. Okay, verse number seven, that's it. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and what? Every eye, is that the rapture? Hello? No, it's both. He cometh with the clouds. The first time he comes for the rapture, he's coming in the clouds, he's just ascending. When he comes at the end of the tribulation period, he's coming in the clouds. And during the, that whole period, talks about the coming, whether it's the rapture or the second coming, the advent, he's coming to call. Everybody's going to see Jesus at some point, but not all together. And here it is, they and they which also, and they also which pierced him. Now, can I ask you a question? Those that pierced him, is that, are they going to see him at the rapture? No. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So in other words, the whole point of the matter is, in order to, we need to rightly divide the word of truth to understand that we are going to see Jesus at the rapture of the church, which was a mystery which Jesus did not reveal or even talk about. Paul revealed. When Paul said, if Jesus, talk, if Jesus talked about the, the rapture, Paul could not have said, I'll show you a mystery. Hello? Paul saying in the, in the book of Corinthians, I'll show you a mystery. We should all be changing all that. He was talking about the rapture of the church, which should take place. If Jesus had talked about that, then it would not have been a mystery when Paul said it. He would not have said that. When he said it was a mystery, he was unveiling something that had never been told before. <laughs> it all takes is us to read the scripture correctly. And so here we go. Those that see him, that pierce them, they're going to see him also. But they're going to see him from a different vantage point. See, I'm going to see him from the vantage point when he, I'm ratchet and caught up with him. And then I'm going to be forever with the Lord. And when he comes back to war and reign, I'm coming with him. And I'm going to judge with him. The Bible says, that, don't you know that the church, church is going to judge the world and the angels? And so I'm judging with him. Amen. And those that pierce him, they're going to see him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall warn, shall wail. I'm not going to wail when he comes back. So again, I did all that because it's in the notes, and I have more in there, just so you can see that Revelation chapter 19 is not talking about the rapture. And also, when you read, when I first started studying Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 21, I thought it was about the rapture. I did. And it didn't make sense. And so that's why people say that, that, that the church is going through the tribulation because they read Matthew and, and Luke thinking that's whatever. The first part of it, yeah, he's addressing certain areas about, you know, and you got to look and see who he's addressing, when he's addressing and all that. 
And I would love to, I would love to, not today, I'm just saying, I would love to break that down because I love it. And so, won't you stand, please? Marquez said you can stand. <laughs> it's 8.59. I told you I'll get you out here early, one minute early. Goodbye, good night, love you.